himself so freely for a sinner such as I. Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter number 9, please. And if you could stand while you're turning there, I'd appreciate it. John chapter number 9. If you don't have a Bible, there's one right there in the back of the pew. John chapter 9. We'll start in verse number 1. John 9 verse number 1 says this. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How are thine eyes open? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for the time that you've given us to read your word. We thank you that uh, we have the opportunity now to listen to your word be preached. We pray that you would be with Pastor Salazar as he gives us your word. We pray that you would just give him the wisdom that he needs to present your word in a way that's meaningful and clear to us. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Fanny Crosby was born in uh, to very humble parents in Southeast New York on March the twenty fourth, eighteen twenty three. She was blinded at the age of six weeks due to improper medical treatment. Throughout her life, though, she was a faithful member of the Saint John's Methodist Episcopal Church in New York City. She was educated. At, uh, at the New York City School for the Blind from 1847 to 1858. She served as a teacher at the school. In 1858, 
Uh, she married a blind um, music man by the name of Alexander Van uh, Alstein, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. And he was, high, he was a highly respected teacher uh, of music at the blind institution. Now, God gave Fanny Crosby the gift of verse. If you don't know what that means, she could write. She was a gifted writer. And uh, with that, uh, with that gift, it is estimated that Fanny Crosby wrote more than 8,000 gospel song texts in her lifetime. Her hymns have been and are still being sung today, most, uh, and they are the, the, the most frequently sung hymns than any other gospel writer that there is. Now, it is said that Fanny Crosby never wrote a hymn without a uh, hymn text without first kneeling in earnest prayer and asking for divine guidance. She wrote uh, such hymns that we sing as Blessed Assurance, Rescue the Perishing, Saved by Grace, and All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Now, the inspiration for the last song, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, was because of a direct answer to prayer. It is reported that one day Fanny, uh, Fanny desperately needed uh, $5 and did not know where she could obtain uh, such an amount. As was her custom, she began to pray about the matter. Within a few minutes, a stranger appeared at her door at just, with just the right amount of money and gave it to her. She said this, and I quote, I have no way of accounting for this except to believe that God, in answer to my prayer, put into the heart of this good man to bring the money. My first thought was, it is so wonderful the way the Lord leads me that I stopped and I immediately wrote a poem and gave it to Dr. Lowry to set it to music. Dr. Lowry was the one that put all of her songs, uh, the music to her songs. In our story this morning, and, and uh, this is a, a true event that took place, we see a man who had a healing. He needed to be healed, though. If you read the entire story, he wasn't just healed physically, but he was going to need emotional healing, and he was going to need spiritual healing. Now, the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about the man and how him and Jesus met. Now, it's interesting, though, if you look back at the text, in, in chapter number 8, Jesus has been preaching in the temple. And, uh, and he has been uh, going back and forth with the religious crowd, with the Sadducees and the Essenes and the Pharisees, uh, just going back and forth about some things. And then when uh, the Jews uh, uh, got mad at him, because and, and, uh, he said that he, was, that he had been before Abraham, he said, before Abraham uh, was, I am. Uh, look at verse 59, it says this. And they took up stones to cast at him, talking about Jesus, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and pass by. Now, as you know, I believe there's going to be Bible history theater up in heaven because I want to see this event. How is Jesus facing this angry mob, ready to stone him, able to walk right through them and them not know where he's at? You know how frustrating that must have been for the religious crowd? Because this, was, this just this wasn't a one-time occurrence. There were other times that, that, that uh, they got mad, they wanted to take Jesus, and then all of a sudden he was just gone. But I want you to notice something very interesting. The very last phrase of chapter, uh, of verse 59, chapter 8 says, so, so passed by, talking about Jesus. And then the very first phrase, it says this, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was, uh, which was born uh, which was blind from his birth. So here Jesus is escaping out of an angry mob that wants to stone him, but yet still he has enough time to stop and show compassion to a man. Now, it doesn't tell us that this, this blind man was crying out. It just says that he begged there, that he was at the temple. Uh, and, and as we learned in, in the book of Acts, there were a lot of people that would come and sit uh, at the temple as people were coming in and out to do their, uh, to do their prayer time. They had a prayer time three times a day uh, there in the temple at nine, at three, and then before sunset, they would come to the temple to pray, uh, the devout Jews. And here he, he just sat, he was sitting there and Jesus took notice of him. Even though uh, Jesus was busy try, trying to get away, he took notice of this man. 
And uh, we see that this man, he had, uh, he had a need. He had a physical need. He was born blind. He was physically blind from birth. He had never seen anything or anyone a day in his life. Now, I have never suffered from blindness. I have had eye surgeries before. And I've had that my, this eye here, I think, has had like four or five surgeries on it. From, from cataract surgery to two retinal detachments, things like that. And, uh, and so I had just like this one eye. And because I've had so many surgeries on that eye, one third of my eye from this five forward, I can't see anything out of. If something happens to this eye, I'm in trouble. See, because as I'm looking at you guys right now, I could see everybody from right here over. Can't see anybody over there. Yeah, I could see you waving. But if I do this, I could see everybody. Or if I open both eyes, I could really see everybody in that. And so there, there's that, that little bit of blindness there. I couldn't imagine, though, not having my sight. Now, probably many of you have been like me. I, I've gone to a place in, in Colorado called the Cave of the Winds. I've been at caves uh, down in Missouri. I've been at caves down in Kentucky where they take you way down in the hole. Then they take and they turn out the lights. It's kind of eerie, isn't it? That you're there in that pitch dark and you can't see anything? Well, you think of this man. His entire life, he had been blind. He'd never seen anything. He'd never seen the beauty of a flower. He'd never seen uh, anything in God's nature. He can only have things described to him, but because he had never seen it, it was probably hard for him to grasp or imagine. But there he sat. He had a physical need. And he was a beggar at the temple. And, uh, but he was specifically noticed by Jesus. But notice something that, that, that takes place. As Jesus passes by, he saw the man which was blind from birth. Verse number two. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Kind of a silly question, don't you think? Did his parents sin, therefore he was born blind? Or did he sin before he was born, and therefore he was born blind? It's the way the question reads, doesn't it? It said, which one sinned? I mean, did Jesus know this guy was gonna be such a bad guy? But Jesus said neither. His disciples immediately raised the theological question. And uh, was this blindness as a result of this man's sin or his parents' sin? Because after all, uh, in, in the Jewish mindset, there was a common belief that the Jews, uh, among Jews, that a physical sickness was a direct result of sin. That's what they thought. And where did they get that thought from? Well, they got it from Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Part of the Ten Commandments says this, And thou shalt not bow thyself uh, to them, talking about other gods, nor serve them, for I... For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So they automatically thought, well, if you have some type of physical ailment, if you're, you're crippled or anything happens to you, then obviously it's a result of your sin. You're just a bad person. And so they asked a the question. But here was a man whom Jesus was going to show the power of God through. Look with me at verses 3. Uh, and on it says, Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor, uh, as, excuse me, nor his parents, but that the works of God may be made manifest in him. To manifest means to render apparent. Jesus confirmed that neither this, this man or his parents had sinned to cause his blindness, but the blindness would, be, uh, would, would make known the compassion and love of God. Look at verse number four. It says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, Jesus was showing once again that he truly was the light of the world. And Jesus gives this man a test of faith and obedience. Remember, so far, this man has asked for nothing. But Jesus took notice of him. The disciples are talking about him. So I'm sure he's hearing this conversation go on. And so here Jesus stops and look at verses number uh, six and seven. It says, and, uh, and when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of spittle. And he anointed the eyes of, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And he said unto him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. 
And he went his way, therefore, and he washed and came seeing. Now, Jesus gives this man a test of obedience and faith. Now, Christ makes the clay to put on his eyes. Now, was it necessary for him to put clay on his eyes or not? For him to to see. No, Jesus could have spoken the words and did it, but he was giving this man a test of faith. He says, I'm gonna I put this clay on your eyes. Now it's up to you to go and to wash at this pool, at the pool of Shalom. Now Jesus instructed the blind man to go and to wash. Now, the pool of Shalom had been made by uh, King Hezekiah. His workers built an underground tunnel from uh, a spring outside of the city walls to carry water into the city. Uh, there was nothing special about the water. Jesus was giving a man a chance to show his faith and obedience by going and washing. We are told in, in James chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, these words. It says, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. I think that when you have faith in Jesus Christ, that you should be obedient to his word. When Jesus says go, you need to go. Now, it was up to the blind man. He could have just sat there. The Bible doesn't tell us whether or not he asked one of the disciples to take him or if a friend went and took him. All we know is what did he do? He went and he washed. And what happened when he washed? What happened when he washed? He was able to see, right? His faith and obedience brought blessing. See how that works? So many times we have faith in God, and as long as we have our faith in God and God tells us to do something and we do it, on the other end of that is blessing. And so the man, it says the man came seeing. The man's obedient brought him great blessing. He comes back to the pool completely healed. And I believe the reason that he came back was that he was looking for Jesus. It says that he, he watched and he came seeing. I mean, after all, Jesus did a great thing for him. He had never seen a day in his life, and he had no idea who Jesus was. He probably could pick him up by hearing his voice. But you think about it. A great miracle took place there. He was blind. He went. He came back seeing. That should make everybody excited. I like the reaction of his neighbors, though. Uh, uh, Look at it. He was a living testimony there uh, of God's grace. Look at verse number eight. It says, uh, the neighbors, therefore, I don't know, uh, who were his neighbors? Were were they like, you know, other blind people there or, you know, uh, other people that were begging money or or, uh, did he go by his house first and and tell his mom and dad? You know, I I don't know, but it says that that his neighbors were there. And they, which before had seen that he was blind, and said, is this not he that sat and begged? He says, wait a minute, there's something different about him today. What is it? What, what's different about him? They saw something in his life. You know what they saw? They saw that he met Jesus. When we meet Jesus face to face, we come away different. Especially if we practice faith and obedience. And here's this man, you think about it. He comes in and the neighbors and says, hey, there's something different about him today. What's going on? He goes, are you Mr. Smith? He goes, what? Your voice, are you Mr. Smith? Man, you're more handsome than your voice. I don't know if he said that or not, but you know, he was happy. I mean, God had blessed him. And you look and the neighbors they're kind of confused. Now look at this, verse number nine says, this is he. And others say, no, 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 no. It's a guy that looks like him. And finally the guy goes, come on, guys, it's me. I'm different. They want to know what made the difference. The man gave a testimony. There was confusion over the man's identity. The miracle changed the man's appearance. Finally he said, I am he. Look at verses 10 through uh, 12. He says this, therefore, said they unto him how were thine eyes opened they knew he was blind all of these people had seen that they had seen this man for years down there at the gate and they had seen him those that were his neighbors that lived next door or across the street or whatever they had watched him grow up suffering from blindness all of his life and they said how in the world did this happen Because up up to this point, nobody that had ever been blind had been able to see. 
that they could figure. Said, what happened? What happened? And he answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Shalom and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. He said, I met Jesus. I met Jesus. How do you think about it? How many of us had our I met Jesus moment? Think about it. When you came to the, to, to the knowledge that you were a sinner, that you were spiritually blind, that you needed Jesus in your life, and you finally figured out, you know what? Jesus says that I need to repent of my sins. And when you repented of your sins, and you asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, all of a sudden, things were different now. You saw things differently. You thought differently. Here this man for the first time was seeing. Is that what a flower looks like? Oh my goodness, what is that thing going? Burp, burp, burp. Is that what a dog is? You think about it. It was all new to him. Remember when you first got saved? It was all new to you. And for this man, it was all new to him. And he said, I, I met him. He said, these are the things I was supposed to do. And when I did them, when I had my faith and I was obedient and I did what he told me to do, I came back changed. We should live changed lives. We should be changed people. Physically, people were looking at him and they saw that there was a difference in his life. And you would think that people would just be excited about that. Then they said unto him, where is he? Who is this Jesus? See, Jesus was just getting started in his ministry. People had heard of him, some of them, but not like this. Said, where is he? And what's he gonna say? He says, I know not. But the one thing that he does know is that he got saved. Having been assured that it was really the man who was blind, the next logical question was, how did he receive his sight? The man related the story to his neighbors and responded by wanting to know where Jesus was. You know what? When we come face to face with Jesus and we are obedient to him, his presence changes us. And when people see a positive change in us naturally, they want to know who or what made the difference. There was something different about him. There was something different. He needed physical healing and he received it. And man, you know, if we just stop the story right there, it'd be great but it doesn't stop there. Look with me. Look at verse number 13. These people didn't know what to do. So they thought, well, we'll just take them to the religious crowd. So they brought to the Pharisees him who that aforetime was blind. And it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said unto them, he put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore, said some, some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man be a sinner that does such things? And there was a division among them. Now think of the stupid, silly argument these people had. Here was this blind man. He was happy that he received his sight. But yet the Pharisees were like, you know what? You're a bad man. And the man that healed you is bad because it's the Sabbath day and you shouldn't be working on the Sabbath day. He shouldn't have, Jesus shouldn't have bent down and made clay and put it on your eyes. You had no business to go wash your eyes. What's wrong with you? That's what they're saying. You now we look at this and think, oh, they weren't being that bad. No, they were being jerks about it. I mean, think about it. They were more worried about following tradition than they were the very fact that this man was a living miracle in front of them, that his life had changed. And so the man faced religious hostility. His healing was not right because it was done on the Sabbath day. Jesus wasn't right because he worked to make clay. This man wasn't right because he went and washed on that day. And the man didn't give them the right answer to their, their question. Look with me. Verse number 17. And they said unto the blind man again, what saith thou of him that opened thine eyes? 
Well, what's the man to think? His answer was what? He's a prophet. He said, hey, I've been in the temple. I've heard the stories. Only prophets do things like this. Elijah, Elisha. They're the people that do these things. He, he is, he's a prophet. There's something different about him. There's something different about him. But, but look with me, verse number 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been born blind. He gave the wrong answer. He said, we think Jesus is a prophet. Remember, these guys were the ones that were getting ready to stone Jesus. They'd been looking for him. They were trying to find a way to rid him. There's no way they wanted to credit Jesus with this man being healed from his blindness. So you know what they do? They begin to doubt. You weren't really blind to begin with. That's what they said. Look, look with me. It says, but the, the Jews did not believe concerning him that he, that he had been blind and received his sight until they called his parents of him that received his sight. And they asked them, saying, is this your son? And look, look how they phrase the question. Whom ye say that was born blind? What are they doing? What are they doing? They're trying to cause the parent to doubt in their answer. They're trying to make sure that everybody that's listening knows that they really think that not only is this man lying, but his parents are going to come in and lie too. It doesn't matter that there were all these other people that had already noticed that, that he was blind. These guys did not want in any way, in any, in any, for any reason, to, to credit Jesus with being who he was, the Son of God. They, they just didn't want to do it. Is this your son, I'm in verse 19, whom ye say was born blind? How doth he now see? And his parents answered and said, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. If anybody's going to know, mom and dad are going to know. Right? They're going to know. And they told him, said he was born blind. So, so they know. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him, and he shall speak for himself. This man's personal integrity was questioned. They didn't believe that he was born blind and could now see. They openly accused his parents, with this man standing there, of lying before they even answered the question. His parents, of all people, knew uh, the truth and testified so. Yet, they feared losing their social status among the people instead of believing their son's testimony of this miraculous healing at the hands of Jesus. They declined to answer the question in the affirmative. Now think about it. Here you are, the, the, the man. Here your parents are, testifying says, yes, he's born blind, but we have no idea how, uh, he, he, wa how, how he received his blindness, Look at, uh, was re received his sight. Look at verse 22. And these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews for the Jews had, already, had agreed already that if any man did confess that Jesus was Christ, that it should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. You know, that had to be a blow to this man emotionally. When his parents cared more about what others thought than they did taking a stand for their son. They were more worried about their social status. Yes, he was an adult. Yes, he, had been, he was born that way and he, he'd been a, he's been adult for a while. But boy, when your own parents won't stand up for you, that would, that, that'd kill you emotionally, wouldn't it? It'd kill you emotionally. They, were, they didn't want to lose their social status. Now we think, well, what's the big deal? It was a big deal. If you didn't belong to the synagogue and you were ostracized, people wouldn't come to your place of business, your neighbors wouldn't have anything to do with you. I mean, you were on the outs. And they were concerned about that. Emotionally, this man had been scarred. But you know what? Despite all that, this man still stood for the truth. Look at verse 23, or look at verse 24. Then again, 
they called, then again called they, the man that was blind, and said unto him, give God praise. We know this man is a sinner. What were they trying to say? Well, they wanted him to attribute the miracle of healing to God alone and to publicly state that Jesus was a sinner because after all, if this man said that he was a sinner, then the people wouldn't believe his message. But instead, what did he do? He declared it a miracle. He said this, look at verse 25. And he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. You could call him whatever you want to, but all I know is there was a miracle. He says, I was blind and now I see. This morning when I woke up, I was blind. This morning when I came down to the temple, I was blind. As I sat there begging uh, for money, I was blind. But when Jesus passed by and he stopped my way and he made that clay and he opened my eyes, he says, now I can see. There's a miracle that's taking place here. I don't understand why you fellows can't see it. Then they said to him again, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? They didn't want to believe it was a miracle. They wanted to know, what did he do? Did he perform some type of operation? You know, it was a magic clay. Was it a magic trick? What in the world took place? But the man still declared it a miracle. And that uh, done by Jesus, and he was living proof. They challenged the fact that it was a miracle. But the man taught them a lesson that they didn't want to learn. Listen to him as he speaks. He answers them when they asked him, what did he do to thee? He says, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore, would ye hear it again? Will ye be uh, also his disciples? He says, hey, I'm not changing my testimony. He says, Jesus healed me. I was blind. It's a miracle. I'm not changing it. I'm not changing it so it'll be more popular with you. I'm not changing the, the facts uh, of the, the case that happened. He said, I'm standing on what I said. And they reviled him. And they, they, just, they just lit into him. They said, thou art his disciple. But we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake uh, unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from uh, whence he is. Listen to the lesson that he teaches them. And the man answered and said unto them, why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is? Yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now, we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God doth and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, ye could, uh, he could do Nothing. The Pharisees wanted to stand on their religious tradition. Said, hey, says, don't talk to us in that manner. Says, we're disciples of Moses. We follow the commandments. Remember 613. I mean, we are strict to the law. Says, you know, uh, uh, you guys can't be right because it was a Sabbath day and, and and your, your eyes were, you were not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath day. They didn't know what to do. They couldn't answer him. But the man stood on the fact that Jesus performed a miracle. The once blind man now rubs salt in their wounded egos. He said, it's astonishing to me, he argues, that here you are, the religious leaders, and you don't know where Christ came from? You don't understand that? You're supposed to be the experts in Scripture and stuff? So then, what, you know what he does? He quotes scripture to them in, in a way. The blind man continues uh, his argument. He says this, God only listens to those that do his will and are not sinners. He's referring back to Psalm 66, verses 18 to 19. He says this, if I, regard, if I regard iniquity in mine heart, and the Lord will not hear me, the Lord will not hear me, but verily God hath heard me and hath attended unto the voice of my prayer. He said, listen, he said, if this man were a sinner, if this man was as bad as you said he was, and he wasn't of God, there's nothing that he could do in and of himself because God wouldn't bless him. 
But this man, Jesus, performed a miracle that no one else had ever done, and God helped him to do it. Therefore, Jesus could not be a sinner. He is not a sinner, for if he was, he could do nothing. He was telling them the truth. And they knew it was the truth. But look at their reaction. And they said unto him, Thou was altogether born in sins, and thou dost teach us. And they cast him out. They cast him out. They couldn't win the argument. They said, We have the power, you're excommunicated. You're out of here. Now you think about it. Emotionally, this man was having a very tough day. The religious leaders officially uh, excommunicated him from their local synagogue. This meant that the man was cut off from his friend and his family uh, and looked uh, and were looked on by the Jews as a publican and sinner. Why? Because he was healed from his blindness by Jesus. Emotionally, he needed healing. The same, uh, and the same one that healed him physically would heal him emotionally and spiritually as well. How do we know that? Luke 19, 10 tells us this. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Think about this man. He stood for the truth and religion let him down. If you're depending upon religion to get you to heaven, you're depending upon the wrong thing. It wasn't religion that did that. You know what? These same Pharisees probably walked by this blind man every day. And every once in a while they'd go, oh, here, here's something. Not one of them ever stopped and anointed his eyes. Not one of them ever reached out to him to take care of him. But Jesus knew that he had a need. Jesus stopped by and made a difference in his life. It wasn't religion, it was Jesus. You know what saves us? It's not religion. It's a relationship. It's relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm very thankful that the word of God tells us that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came seeking us. That doesn't mean that Jesus personally came looking, but Jesus impressed upon somebody's heart to ensure that this young man heard the gospel. Maybe he came through his parents. Maybe it came through somebody on a bus route. Maybe it came through somebody handing them a gospel track. But Jesus was there. And I love this story because here the man, he, he was healed physically. He had a miracle performed in his life. And religion said, it never took place. You're a liar. Because this man that supposedly healed you we don't care for. You know what? People don't care if you're religious. They don't care if you're religious. There are a lot of religious people that are out there. But when you start serving Jesus and you start invoking the name Jesus, all of a sudden, mm -mm -mm. hey, you can come down to the state house and pray. Just don't pray in Jesus' name. But he's my Savior. Hey, we don't, we don't care if you want to celebrate, you know, Christmas with ho, ho, ho and all that other stuff. Just don't put up a manger scene in public. They want to try to wipe out the fact that there is a Jesus. And that's what, it started all the way back then. He needed physical healing. He needed emotional healing. But he also needed spiritual healing. Look with me, if you would, please, as we finish up this account. Jesus, uh, verse number 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out and when he had found him, if you are looking for something, it's important, isn't it? If somebody's looking for you, it's important. And Jesus knew that this man needed him and he went and he found him. He found him. He said to him, dost thou believe on the son of God? And he answered, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, thou hast both seen him, and is he that talketh to thee. Can you imagine? 
Here this man was hurting inside. Nobody wanted to believe him. People were afraid to believe him, yet even though they saw the miracle. But here Jesus comes and says, hey, even though religion um, rejected you, I have sought you. This man demonstrated his practical faith in God. But now he was presented with a chance to commit himself to Christ. Look at what it says. Jesus came looking for him and said, hey, the Savior's right before you. You've seen him. Remember, he came back looking for who healed him. He said, and here I am. And what was the man's reaction? Look with me, verse number 38. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Don't discount that. Here he was in front of the Savior. He knew that it took a miracle for him to see. And he wanted to know who, who to give that thanks to directly. And here Jesus is standing in front of him. And he says, do you believe? He says, oh, I believe. And he immediately put his belief into action and worshiped Jesus. I don't know what he did. I don't know if he bowed down to the ground. I don't know if he threw his arms around him and started crying and thanking him. I just know that he was changed. He was changed. And Jesus could see the change. He could see the sincerity in his heart. This man responded in faith and worshiped Christ. Observing the man's humble response, Christ declared this. Look at verse number 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into the world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. What was Jesus saying here? Those who do not see but want to see, such as the blind man, will see. But those that think that they see, such as the Pharisees, who would depend upon their religion, they'll always be blinded by their religion. Hold your place there and just turn over a few pages to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. In John chapter 3 and verse number 16, Follow with, along with me as I read. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. Who was that light? Jesus said, told his disciples at the beginning of all of this, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Here Jesus says he is talking to Nicodemus earlier, uh, says uh, this, and this is the common condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. These Pharisees had a fair chance to believe who Jesus was. They of all people should have known all the prophecies, all of the things that were said concerning Christ, they had a chance to see the light. But because Jesus was bad for the religious business, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. And so they remained spiritually blind. They were condemned because they loved darkness rather than the light. For everyone, verse number 20, that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth the truth cometh to the light, and that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Here Jesus tells him, as this man's worshiping him, and people are watching what's going on. Just trust me, everywhere that Jesus went publicly, there were Pharisees there trying to entangle or catch him in some way. And Jesus says this man is worshiping him. Gives, gives that testimony again in verse 39. And Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world that they which see uh, not might see. Show the evidence of this blind man. Because he just didn't see physically. But he had his emotional needs taken care of and he had his spiritual needs taken care of by Jesus. And he sits there as, as an example before them, a living example. And they which might see might be made blind. 
Then you see the reaction. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. You know what? If you'd have been like this man, and you weren't dependent upon your religion, and you needed, and you, you truly needed something other than your religion, you'd be able to see. But ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. The Savior warned the Pharisees of their spiritual blindness. The Pharisees thought their religious knowledge and practice made them see spiritually. But their trust in religion blinded them to the fact that the Savior and the Messiah that they were waiting for was standing right in front of them. But being spiritually blinded, they could not see him. Don't, don't, don't allow religion to blind you spiritually. Jesus so much desires a personal relationship with you and I. There was an eye surgeon that went to China as a missionary and began practicing in one of the Chinese hospitals. And one of the first surgeries he performed was on a man who had been nearly blinded by cataracts. The operation was successful and the man recovered his eyesight. A few weeks later, the missionary was greatly surprised when 48 blind men showed up at his hospital doorstep. These blind men had walked more than 250 miles from a remote area of China to get to the hospital in order that they might have their sight restored. They had traveled the entire distance by holding on to a rope to keep them all together. And guess who was at the front holding the rope? It was a man who had his sight restored. If you were once spiritually blind, and we all were, we were blinded by sin, but we have come to the Savior, you know what our task is now? Is to find others that are blind. That's our task. It's personally given to us. And here you have a beautiful practical example that Jesus gives to us. There are people that are out there that have a need. Sometimes people cry out and other times they don't. But we shouldn't have this attitude, well, you know, if you're down and out, it's your fault. You don't know anything about anybody's backstory. There are so many testimonies in, the, in this room where God has forgiven us of great sin. Of great sin that none of us would ever want to get up and have it shown in front of everybody what God saved us from or out of. But since we received our spiritual sight, he's also saved us from a lot of sin. And if we have the truth and if we have the answer, then it's incumbent upon us to tell others. I guarantee you this blind man didn't keep it to himself. The word of God tells us if our gospel be hid, it is hid to who? To them that are lost. Remember that song that we were taught in Sunday school? All I have to do is go like this. and Everybody already knows what the song is, don't you? Sing with me, ready? This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Won't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Yeah, we can go to the other verses, but I think you get the point. You have a light. Jesus said, as long as I am in the world. Jesus is still in the world today. You know who he chose to shine through? Us. I'm like a great big giant lighthouse. And people should be able to see Jesus in me. But not just me. But you. 
this man received healing grace. And I guarantee you, he told others about who Jesus was. What are you doing to help the spiritually blind? Let's stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please. Maybe you're here this morning with your heads bowed and eyes closed and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. Can I invite you to come forward this morning so you can see how you can have that light? Jesus Christ wants to save you. He wants to have a relationship with you. If you don't know Christ, your Lord and personal Savior, there are folks that are up here that could take the word of God and can show you how you could start that relationship with him. Or maybe you're here uh, this morning and you have been saved and you want to be scripturally baptized. And uh, we're in the middle of, of getting the baptistry uh, cleaned. And uh, but pretty soon it'll be filled again. And, uh, and you could follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Or maybe you're here, you've been saved and baptized, and you want to join the church. Whatever your needs are this morning, why don't you come? Father, we just pray, God, you'd be with this time of invitation. Lord, help us, Lord, to keep our light shining for you. If we ask in your precious name, amen.